press a button. Did that do anything? Ooh. Hey, this is cool. Okay. Thank you, John. Well, good morning. My thoughts today have come from a recent study of Genesis. Of all the many interesting people in that book, the person whose story most resonates with me, anyway, is Jacob. And I'd like to use the experiences of Jacob to explore a theme that I think is summed up by the word contending. The very human desire to strive and strain to have control over our lives and be the masters of our own destinies. It's a relevant topic, I think, given the ongoing pandemic. It was around about this time two years ago when patient zero first became sick in China. And since then, at some point, we have probably all had moments where we felt helpless. Even if you've never come into contact with COVID, at some point, it has probably kept you at home, cut you off from friends and family, kept you from working or changed the way you work, made you wear a mask, or canceled events that you've been looking forward to. COVID took away some of our autonomy, our ability to have a normal level of control over what we can do each day. And we've had very little say in that. It doesn't feel good. It's frustrating. It's frustrating because we are forced to acquiesce to other people's plans at the expense of our own, and we are buffeted along not able to do much other than following directions and waiting this thing out. It can be hard to abide by plans that have been set for us by others. In South Australia, the government chose the 23rd of November as the date when borders would open to an extent. And we were not asked our opinions on that. There was no vote. It just happened. And if it made life hard for you, too bad. That decision was not yours. At times, and maybe most times, it's easy enough to obey the authorities. At other times, like when their directions are nothing like what we want to do, obedience is hard. I started thinking about this recently when I was grappling with something that I wanted to control and couldn't. I like fixing things around the house. When something breaks, I want to fix it myself. So usually I watch a YouTube video about how to do it, and then I have a go, and it usually works out. But recently I had a problem I couldn't fix, and I had to call in what turned out to be a long parade of incompetent tradies. Now, setting aside the fact that those people let me down, that's another issue, what I found when examining my own attitude to this situation was that I was really frustrated by my lack of control. I was not the boss. And by law, in fact, I had to trust other people to do this particular work for me. And there are good reasons that law exists. But if I could have solved that problem through self-effort and contending with it myself, I would have. Standing back and trusting another party was really hard. So that's an example of what I'm trying to get at. When there's something in life we don't like, often our inclination is to contend with it, to try to gain control over it. This is especially true when suffering is involved. When something in life has gone awry, we just naturally want to contend with it and fix it. We might become focused on a course of action that we believe is best, and at times we might do so without prayer or waiting on God for direction because we think we can handle it ourselves. Jacob, patriarch of Israel, he was someone who grappled with this all his life. He was a fighter, 
striving, ambitious, a Slytherin, if I may. <laughs> From even before he was born, he was fighting. He and his twin brother Esau jostled each other in their mother's womb. He was born second, but gripping his brother's heel as if already grasping for a higher station. And he was named for this, Jacob, meaning he grasps the heel, which is a Hebrew idiom for he deceives. So at birth, already his character was evident. And I'd like to just walk with you through some key events in the life of Jacob, the contender. The first recorded episode of Jacob's life is perhaps the most famous. In Genesis 25, we read about how Jacob managed to swindle his brother out of the rights, uh, his rights as the firstborn by taking advantage of Esau when he was hungry. Jacob offered Esau a bowl of stew in exchange for the birthright. Esau was very foolish to accept this obviously terrible trade, but Jacob's behaviour was worse. He did this selfish thing for his benefit, and hurting Esau in the process didn't seem to matter to him. Jacob wanted that birthright, so he bought it. He wanted to take charge of his destiny. And then Esau copped it again in chapter 27, when, not content with just the birthright, Jacob conspired to get his brother's special blessing from their father Isaac. In this case, he plotted with his mother, Rebecca, and in fact, in fact, Rebecca seemed to be the instigator of this particular scheme, but Jacob didn't raise any objections. His only comment about the plan was that some trickery would be required to convincingly impersonate Esau. So wearing Esau's clothes and goat skins for hairiness, Jacob easily lied to his father and took his brother's blessing. When Esau found out, got mad, and began plotting to kill Jacob, Jacob didn't bother making peace with Esau. Instead, he hit the road and fled on the pretext of needing to go to Haran to find a wife. So at this point, Jacob has been contending against his own station in life. As the second born, he wasn't entitled to the rights and benefits of the first born. That didn't stop him from wanting them and cooking up plots to get them. In doing so, he set a pattern of striving for his own success that would be with him for most of his life. And also, notably, the record doesn't mention Jacob ever reaching out to God or showing the slightest concern about what God might think of his actions. Jacob, as we know, was the descendant of Abraham chosen by God to be the father of the 12 men, who in turn would be the fathers of the 12 tribes. And from one of those tribes would eventually come the Messiah. So Jacob was to be a very important player in the story of the salvation of the world. So far, though, you might wonder why. He doesn't seem like a likely candidate for such an important role. But God surprises us. Jacob may not have reached out to God, but God reached out to him. And we see this in Genesis 28. Jacob stopped for the night, and he had the famous dream where he saw a stairway to heaven with angels ascending and descending. And he heard the voice of God reiterating, reiterating to him the promises to Abraham, that his descendants would be like the dust of the earth, that they would possess that land, and that all peoples on earth would be blessed through him and his offspring. And on waking up, Jacob was impressed and awed. He understood that he just had an encounter with God. But his response was a bit odd, to say the least. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will watch over me on this journey I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. Now, readings of this vow uh, vary, but the most common interpretation is that Jacob responded to God's revelation of himself and his amazing promises with a bit of bargaining. And I 
tend to agree with that interpretation because at this stage of his life, as a young man, Jacob was like that. He was a man who liked to be in control and get ahead by his own effort. So essentially he said, okay, God, I hear your promises. If you come through on that, then you have my allegiance. But you prove yourself first. His brazen attitude was that he was happy to have God on his side if God could be useful to him. He carried on to Haran, and, and that was where the unbelievable mess of his marriages happened. Jacob began working for his uncle Laban, hoping to marry Rachel. But Laban pulled a swifty on him, and Jacob was tricked into marrying Leah instead. Jacob remained married to Leah, but also married Rachel, in exchange for remaining in his uncle's service for a further seven years. And the sisters, married to the same man, sank into raging jealousy and started trying to one-up each other by having children, a competition that Jacob enabled. It was complicated and it was really awful. Now, from the perspective of Jacob's character development, this was where hardship first really hit him. His life had been going pretty much according to plan up to that point. Even fleeing from Esau wasn't ideal, but it didn't really put him out. He would have gone to Haran to look for a wife anyway. But now the deceiver is deceived. Having performed some clever tricks in the past, he was finally the subject of a trick himself, courtesy of Uncle Laban. Did it drive him to God? Nope. There's no record of Jacob praying or giving God a thought in these years. In fact, the only recorded intervention by God in this time was towards Leah, when God enabled her to have children because he could see she wasn't loved. It appeared that Jacob and God weren't talking. Jacob did not suddenly change his character because of hardship. But God was playing a long game with this man and was never truly absent from events. In chapter 30, Jacob remained as ambitious as ever. The years he had agreed to work for Laban had passed and he could go home, but when Laban said he didn't want Jacob to leave, Jacob agreed to stay because he saw an opportunity to get rich. Jacob got Laban to agree to an arrangement where they shared the flocks of sheep, but then he rigged the system so that the strong sheep went to him and the weak sheep went to Laban. So over time, Jacob built up a great wealth of sheep as well as camels, donkeys and servants. So it seems like Jacob isn't learning anything. He's still deceitful. And just like he stepped on Esau all those years ago to get what he wanted, he now steps on Laban to get what he wants. And eventually Laban wised up and realised that Jacob had been getting rich at his expense, so Jacob thus made himself another enemy. At this point, God speaks again. In chapter 31, God said to Jacob, Go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. A simple command. If this had been directed to Abraham... The next verse would have been, early in the morning the next day, Abraham settled his affairs, saddled his donkey, and returned to the land of his fathers. But this is Jacob. He did obey God, but he did so in the way that suited him. First, he talked it over with Leah and Rachel, and they decided that, yeah, on balance, it was probably good to leave, and then knowing that Laban had a low opinion of him, Jacob decided to not mention that they were leaving. He deceived Laban again by quietly sneaking away, taking with him all his wealth. Now Jacob, um, he acknowledged God. He even acknowledged that God had been with him all that time and had kept him from harm. But even after all those years of difficulties, his first inclination was to engineer his own safety and success, not consult God about it. 
If there was a problem, he would contend with it himself through self-effort and scheming. Still, you know, God was patient. When Laban angrily gave chase, it was God's intervention that held Laban back from attacking Jacob. The two men ultimately made a truce and agreed to part company peacefully, but it could have ended very differently had God not warned Laban not to harm Jacob. How long could Jacob ignore God's gentle direction and prompting? But events were building up. After things resolved with Laban, Jacob intended to return home. But he knew that Esau would be there, and of course he hadn't left things on a happy note with Esau. So he sent messengers ahead, hoping to find that Esau would welcome him back. Maybe time had healed Esau's murderous grudge. Unfortunately, the message that returned was that Esau was racing to meet him, and he had what looked a lot like an army with him. And it was that event that finally prompted a different reaction in Jacob. His response, recorded in chapter 32, was, to quote, great fear and distress. Now that was unlike him. He was not the sort of person to be rattled by fear, but he feared Esau. Last he saw Esau, he wanted to kill him, and now he's backed up by 400 men. Jacob's vulnerable clan of women and children were sitting ducks. It could be a bloodbath. Initially, Jacob got up to his usual tricks to try to avert disaster. First, he divided his family and servants into two groups and separated them, thinking that if Esau managed to kill one group, maybe the other could get away. And that's not ideal, but it's something. Then he selected gifts from his own wealth, and he sent his servants ahead to meet Esau in several waves bearing these gifts. He thought maybe he could pacify Esau by plying him with these offerings. But even that seemed like a weak attempt to salvage the situation. Jacob's fear remained. And in his fear, he was driven to try something new. He prayed for help. There's a saying that when we are at our lowest point, we are open to the greatest change. And if anyone recognises where that's from, I'm sorry to quote a cartoon in an exhortation. Not really. Uh, but it is apt. It's a principle that's clear in scripture that sometimes you have to be broken down before you can be built back up. Fire refines metal and makes it beautiful, but in doing so, the metal must lose its old shape. A seed planted in the ground can become a great tree, but to make way for the tree, the seed must be destroyed. When we are low in suffering, that's when change is most able to happen. Nobody wants to change when times are good because they're happy where they are. But when times are bad, we are open to change. Times were now bad for Jacob. In his fear and distress about Esau, he did something new. He prayed. His prayer in chapter 32 is his first recorded prayer since the dream at Bethel. And for all we know, it could have been decades since he last spoke to God. It's at least been decades since he said anything to God that was significant enough to warrant a mention in scripture. In desperation, he appealed to God to save him from Esau. He reminded God of his promises and he begged for help, acknowledging his own unworthiness in the face of God's kindness and faithfulness. This was a turning point for him. That night, Still in terrible anticipation of the arrival of Esau, Jacob found himself alone. And then probably the strangest episode of his life took place. He encountered someone who appeared to be a man, 
but who we later learn was an angel representing God himself. There's a real lack of detail in the record, but somehow Jacob and the angel got to physically fighting and they wrestled until the sun came up. It's not clear how Jacob got into a fight with an angel, but we do know that Jacob understood the identity of his opponent and that he fought hard, so hard that the angel was not able to overpower him. Eventually, the angel ended it by disabling Jacob's hip with a single touch. But even then, Jacob wasn't done saying, I will not let you go until you bless me. And I think this has to be one of the most bizarre events recounted in Genesis. Jacob's response to encountering an angel is shocking. He clearly understood the divine power of the angel, or he wouldn't have asked for a blessing. He at least respected that and acknowledged the power of God. But he wasn't humble. He wasn't humble. I mean, God himself, for all intents and purposes, had appeared before him and Jacob said, fight me. And even after the angel disabled him with one simple move, proving that all along the angel had been letting him win, Jacob didn't back off. Bless me, he demanded. You're not going anywhere until you bless me. Well, what is this attitude? Of all the challenges Jacob had contended with, could he not draw the line at contending with God himself? But perhaps what's even more extraordinary is that the angel did not reprimand him. Again, God surprises us. The angel said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. And Israel, as we learn, is a name that means something like he contends with God or he struggles with God. It's not really the most desirable moniker, if you ask me. I mean, couldn't the patriarch of the chosen nation, the ancestor of Christ himself, be named something a bit more positive, like he loves God or he walks with God, you know? But, but it is an honest name. This is the man who contends, even with God. Another thing that strikes me in this verse is that although the angel said that Jacob had struggled and overcome, Jacob didn't actually win the wrestling match. He had held his ground and, yes, he came out of it victorious in that he got the blessing he wanted, but he got the blessing only because the angel standing in for God, was content to give it. I don't believe for a moment the angel gave that blessing because he felt backed into a corner and obligated to bless. After all, Jacob didn't walk away with a blessing. He limped away with a blessing. That's an important detail. And I wonder if a penny dropped for Jacob in that moment. He just spent all night fighting an opponent who, as it turned out, could have crushed him at any time, but didn't. The angel could have killed him, but didn't. The angel could have cursed him, but did the opposite and blessed him. For Jacob, the realisation must have been a slap in the face. He had never been in control of that fight. And in fact, his whole life up to that point had been just like that wrestling match. Him putting in lots of effort and energy and striving to try to overcome men and God. And God, for many years, humouring his efforts, waiting the night out, letting him try. But now at last, God had shown Jacob that all along it had been God who had granted him success. 
It had been God who had protected him from enemies, God who had increased his wealth, God who had increased his family, God who had given him every good thing. And now Jacob was Israel, the man named for contending with God and overcoming, and even that victory was handed to him by God. It's as if God had said, you fight and strive against men and against me, and for what? If you wanted my blessing, all you had to do was ask. I'll give you the victory. And I'll give you the victory because I'm God and that is my character. Your character is to contend, but you have and will overcome because of me. The next day, the encounter with Esau took place, and it all worked out. Esau treated his brother much like the father of the prodigal son, welcomed the son home. He ran to Jacob, threw his arms around him, kissed him and cried. All was forgiven. And Jacob's relief must have been overwhelming. Now, following the wrestling match with the angel, there was a, a noticeable difference in Jacob, I'd say even though he remained a bit of a schemer. I think it's important to observe that it was not Jacob's personality that God changed. Throughout the remainder of Genesis, Jacob was still a contender, someone who liked to be in control. But in the course of time, just little by little, God took the raw material that was Jacob the contender and expanded and guided his character so that he became a man of great faith. And that did not happen all at once. Jacob continued to fall back on self-effort at times. For example, he disobeyed God by setting up his home in Shechem instead of returning to his father, thinking that for whatever reason, Jacob was going to be a better place to live. <laughs> it wasn't, and the consequences for his family were horrific. Later, in circumstances of famine, he became so desperate to ensure the safety of his favoured son, Benjamin, that he refused to let him out of his sight, even when that was an unreasonable choice that put the whole family at risk, especially poor Simeon, who Jacob charmingly made no effort to save. But, but, in these later years, there is evidence of a growing faith in Jacob. He began actively seeking God. For example, not long after parting company with Esau, Jacob built an altar, and he gave it a name meaning God, the God of Israel thus making good on the vow he had made years earlier at Bethel by declaring that, yes, this God was his God. He told his family to get rid of their foreign idols and he even buried the idols under a tree. As he travelled the land, he had a new habit of building altars and memorial pillars, making offerings of drink and oil. He also maintained a friendly relationship with Esau, and upon the death of Isaac, the two brothers were able to come together peacefully to bury their father together. He was no longer the young man who'd worn a costume to trick his father into blessing him. He had encountered God, and he had been changed. As the years passed for Jacob, what I observed to be the key change is that he stopped leaning on his own strength quite so often and instead increasingly leaned on his faith in God. I'd like to look particularly at one little episode very near the end of Jacob's life. And I love this bit because I think it illustrates clearly how much he transformed. Uh, it's in Genesis 48, and Jacob was very old, sick, he could hardly see, he was not expected to live much longer. He'd been living well in Egypt, surrounded by his family. And one day his son Joseph brought his sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, to receive a blessing from their grandfather. 
And the firstborn of these two was Manasseh. Therefore, Manasseh was the one who would rightfully receive the greater blessing. And this is it here from Genesis 48. We read, When Israel saw the sons of Joseph, he asked, Who are these? They are the sons God has given me here, Joseph said to his father. Then Israel said, Bring them to me so I may bless them. And Joseph took both of them, Ephraim on his right, toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh on his left, toward Israel's right hand, and brought them close to him. But Israel reached out his right hand and put it on Ephraim's head, though he was the younger, and crossing his arms, he put his left hand on Manasseh's head, even though Manasseh was the firstborn. And then he blessed them like that. When Joseph saw his father placing his right hand on Ephraim's head, he was displeased. So he took hold of his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to him, No, my father, this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. Joseph perhaps thought that because his elderly father was unable to see clearly, he was mixing the two boys up. But what actually happened behind the scenes was that God had revealed to Jacob that although both boys would be blessed, it was actually the younger one, Ephraim, who would go on to be the greater of the two. So Jacob refused to uncross his arms. And I do love his response in verse 19, where it says, his father refused and said, I know, my son. I know. We can't presume to know the tone of those words or what was really going through Jacob's mind. But when I read this, and if I may read a little between the lines, I hear a bit of wryness. Joseph says, No, Dad, you're doing it wrong. Manasseh is the firstborn. And Jacob says, son, trust me, I know. Did he ever? Jacob was himself a second born, and he got the blessing of the firstborn through a silly charade of self-effort, wearing his brother's clothes and boldly lying to his father. Now, when God says, I've chosen the second born this time too, Jacob just says, fine. God will do what God will do. I think by this time Jacob knew well that the blessings he had received over the course of his life were all really the doing of God and not at all the achievement of a deceitful and willful man. Jacob had spent his life in contest with men and sometimes even with God but every victory had been God's. He had contended and overcome only because God gave him the win. So he saw how it was to be with Ephraim and Manasseh and it didn't trouble him. He also believed God when God said that one day the Israelites would leave Egypt and return to the promised land, their land. Jacob believed that would happen but made no effort to make it happen himself. Instead, the record reads that he simply said to Joseph, when I die, make sure you bury me in Canaan, not Egypt, because our family will return there one day. And Joseph promised to do so, and Jacob worshipped as he leaned on his staff. And this is the scene of Jacob's life highlighted in the famous passage about faithful people in Hebrews 11. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on top of his staff. It says something to me that the writer of Hebrews chose this moment as the best memorial of Jacob's faith. Like, this is one of the last things Jacob ever did. He was an old, old man, leaning on his staff, when he blessed Joseph's sons according to the design of God, not the design of man. 
in the past, I've thought that this is an odd choice, really, for the Hebrews 11 verse about Jacob. It's not very dramatic. Noah built the ark. Abraham was willing to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. And Jacob was old and blessed his grandsons. But on thinking about it, this is when Jacob's faith peaked. It was when the contender was finally content. And I pray that it will not take me or any of us our entire lifetimes to come to the same conclusion that rather than contending with men and with God to force our way in life by our own effort, there's great contentment to be found in gladly giving God command of our lives, leaving us simply to stand in faith and worship. So what might that look like? What are some lessons from Jacob's life that we could apply to ourselves? Well, I think Jacob's hard-won lessons are still as relevant as ever. People continue to struggle against other people and against God to this day. So here's just a, a few thoughts to leave you with. Firstly, know when to stop contending. On a previous occasion, I've spoken about Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. And how in that verse, the verb rendered be still, most precisely means lose, give up, fail even, quit the fight. I find that a fascinating way to describe the act of resting in God, giving him the things that worry us and trusting him to fight for us. There's great contentment in this. And also, I deliberately chose to word this as know when to stop contending rather than don't ever contend at all. Faith without deeds is dead. And certainly there are times when we are called to take action or contend with something. Jacob was a man of action, and his actions were not all wrong, not at all. His preparations for meeting Esau, for example, dividing his family, getting together some gifts for his brother, they were, in a way, prudent efforts to protect himself and his family. But contending becomes wrong when our own obstinate determination to control the situation by our own power puts us at odds with God. When we grab the metaphorical steering wheel away from God and say, oh, just let me drive, uh, that's when we've gone too far. We've gone too far when we presume to tell God what he should do, when our prayers are demanding rather than humble, when our solutions hurt others, and when personal pride or ambition is our motivation. On occasions like that, when our will is not aligned with God's will, we may as well be wrestling an angel. God's will always prevails in the end. So save yourself some drama and know when to be still. Secondly, God will contend for you. There wasn't anything about Jacob that made him a worthy candidate to become Israel, father of a nation. As a young man, he was deceitful and selfish. We can more easily see why God would choose Abraham, a man who wasn't perfect, but who did rather naturally have an inclination towards faith. Jacob was Abraham's grandson, but really didn't take after him. Honestly, if God had tested Jacob the way he had Abraham by telling him to go to Mount Moriah and sacrifice his firstborn son, I think Jacob's response would have been to argue his way out of it. Or worse, challenge God. Oh yeah, make me. But God had promised Abraham 
that from his offspring would come the Messiah and the salvation of the world. And God doesn't break his promises. So he met Jacob where he was, flaws and all. And over the course of a lifetime and many hard events, Jacob was transformed into the faithful old patriarch who worshipped as he leaned on his staff. God was pleased to name Jacob, and therefore also his chosen people, Israel, meaning he contends with God. It's a name that tells a story. It tells us the story of humanity, which contended against God when it gave in to sin. But in an interesting twist, there's another way you can read the name Israel. It can also be read, God contends. Because as much as humanity contended with God in turning to sin, God also contended for us when he didn't give up on sinful humanity. When Jacob tried wrestling with an angel, despite the futility, the angel, representative of God, did not kill Jacob, did not humiliate him, disabled him only as much as was necessary to end the fight, did not reprimand him, did not abandon him, and did bless him immensely. Likewise, don't think for a moment that any occasion when you have contended with God and sinned against him is going to make him abandon you. If God could work with Jacob, who was so feisty he tackled an angel, God can work with you. He'll even fight to get you back from sin. Which leads to the third and final point. The biggest contest is already won. God promised many great things to Jacob that he didn't see fulfilled in his lifetime. As an old man in Egypt, he could only worship as he pondered the distant future and wondered how the biggest contest was going to play out. And God kept his word. One day, a descendant of Jacob from the tribe of Judah would fight and win the ultimate contest. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed that God's will would be done, no matter what it took. Jesus didn't fight back against the unjust and infuriating treatment he received. He didn't allow himself to be provoked. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, trusting in his God in circumstances when anyone else would have contended like never before. It's poetic that Jesus' complete obedience and quiet submission to the will of God, which to the unbelieving onlookers must have looked so weak, was actually so strong that it delivered the final blow against the power of sin and death. The biggest contest was one with self-sacrifice, not a raised fist. Contending with problems, with other people, maybe even with the will of God, are the fights of everyday life that we've been thinking about today. But I think it's good to end by remembering that the one fight we were never going to win on our own was won by Jesus Christ, who faced that fight for us. What a magnificent metaphor there is in the scene of Jacob wrestling with the angel. We were the Jacob in that fight. When we chose sin, we chose to fight God. We told him we knew better. And we argued. And we struggled. And we even demanded to be blessed anyway, presuming our own worth and threatened that we would not back down 
and we would not accept the wages of death that God had told us was the due penalty for our sin. God, represented by the angel in that fight, engaged with us. He did not turn his back, leave us alone, or refuse to respond. Nor did he just kill us, which he could have done at any time. But instead, he got involved with us. He allowed us to grapple with him for however long our night time lasted because he had promised our salvation and he was going to do it. The fight ended when the sun came up. God ended it because he could see that we were just going to fight ourselves to death and he had to intervene. So just like the angel disabled Jacob and gave him a limp to get him to be still, God changed us and is always changing us to teach us stillness. Sometimes it hurts when we are touched by God. Sometimes there's injury in the process of transformation. And sometimes it takes a long time, even a lifetime, to be still before God and recognise his sovereignty over our struggles. The sun came up for us in the form of God's son, Jesus Christ. Our fight against sin ended when the Lord Jesus won it for us on the cross. God accepted the sacrifice of Christ. And in his grace, he was willing to take the victory that belongs truly to Christ alone and describe it to us. That was why the angel could truthfully say to Jacob, you have contended and have overcome. Jacob was down, he was injured, he'd not won at all. But the angel said, you have overcome. Likewise, though our self-effort does not win us, does not earn us any favour from God, because of Christ, God says to us, you have overcome. He has overcome. So you have overcome. Thank you.